Mitigating enthalpy changes has been the focus of the last few videos, but we've been limited to what we can do in terms of communicating because we haven't been able to generate for ourselves the amount of energy involved in a particular reaction. So being able to predict how much energy is involved is actually very important. And this is accomplished through Hess's law. And that's going to be the purpose of this video is to look at how we can use Hess's law to make predictions and then to derive an algebraic version of the same law. This is going to require us to understand that a lot of the common reactions that we run into don't actually appear as simply as we uh, perceive. So for example, the combustion of methane doesn't just go straight to carbon dioxide and water vapor necessarily, but can go through a number of uh, different oxidation states in order to arrive at uh, carbon dioxide. So if we happen to know how much energy is involved in the stepwise components, then we can add those together to get to the overall enthalpy. That can be summarized in a diagram like this one, where what we're interested in is how much energy is involved to go from the reactants to the products directly, as represented by delta H1. But let's say that we know the stepwise enthalpies. So to go from the reactants to the intermediates is delta H2, and to go from the intermediates to the products is delta H3. Quite simply, what Hess's law tells us is that we can add delta H2 to delta H3 to figure out the value of delta H1. Another way of looking at it is like this. If we wanted to go straight from carbon and oxygen to carbon dioxide, we'd be looking at the large arrow on the left. However, it's possible that in limited uh, quantities of oxygen, we might actually have to do the reaction stepwise, go through the carbon monoxide intermediate, and then finally arrive at carbon dioxide. And you'll notice that the sum of the small arrows is the same as the, the large arrow on the left. That is visually what Hess's law kind of looks like. So Hess's law stated uh, looks like this. The enthalpy change for a chemical reaction is the same regardless of the pathway taken. So it could be directly with one step, or it could be through some kind of an intermediate or through several steps. And the consequence of that is that whatever reactions you have to add up to get to your net equation, if you take the energies associated with those reactions and add them up, you will also get to the net enthalpy change. So here's a few examples, and the first one is really easy, so not much to really talk about here. You'll notice that we're trying to figure out the delta H value for the top reaction. And what we've been given are a couple of reactions where the delta H's are known. Again, you can label those however you like, delta H2 and delta H3, like in the first example. And what we're trying to do is find the so-called delta H1. Now, you'll notice that if you sum up the reactions that are uh, presented, quite simply, you actually will cancel out the two NOs as in any creation of a net reaction, uh, something that you produce in one reaction but consume in a different reaction essentially will cancel out in the net process. And the other component is that the oxygen that's present in both of the reactants becomes additive. We get two oxygens that are required in the overall process. So simply, what Hess's law would say is that since adding these two reactions together would give us the net reaction that we see at the top, if we added the two enthalpy changes over on the side, we would get the net enthalpy change for the overall reaction at the top. When we do that, you'll notice that that value is positive 68 kilojoules. Hess's law can be quite a bit more challenging. And so what we're gonna do is have a look at an example where some manipulation is needed in order to get to the final answer. So having a look here, it looks like we've got a lot of molecules and, and atoms that we have to deal with here. 
But what I'd like to do is focus on the compounds uh, in each of these reactions that are going to cue us to trying to figure out what's going on. And the questions that I'm going to ask myself are first, when I make the comparison of the compounds, are they on the same side of the equation? And do they have the same coefficients? So just for ease of notation, I'm going to label the givens as 1, 2, and 3. And we're going to have a look in the first case at carbon dioxide as a suspect molecule. And when we do so, in both the target equation and in equation 1, they are on the same side of the equation with the same coefficient. So essentially, I can leave equation 1 exactly the way it is, and everything's fine. However, for equation 2, you'll notice that uh, it's not as useful in this case. The SO2 is on the same side of the equation, but the coefficient doesn't match up. So we need to do a manipulation here. We're going to take equation 2 and multiply it by 2. And the consequence of that is that we're going to have this reaction as a result. And if you consider that we're doubling the uh, amount of SO2 that is being produced, the consequence of that is that we are also going to double the energy that's involved. So the enthalpy change here is going to be uh, twice as big as what is listed. If we then have a look at equation 3, we notice that the coefficient looks like it's matched up. However, it's on the wrong side of the equation. So what we're going to have to do in this case is to take that reaction and reverse it. And we'll look at the consequence of that in a moment. So in this case, what we would be doing is taking the reaction that in its notation right now looks like it's endothermic, and by reversing it, we are uh, changing the location of the energy term. The way that it's written currently would have the energy term as a reactant, but by reversing it and flipping it, it would now end up on the product side. The quantity of energy would be the same, so all that we have to do in this case is to change the sign in front of the energy term. So to get the net reaction then, what we're going to be doing is taking equation 1. Uh, we're going to take equation 2 times 2. And then we're going to be taking the flipped of equation 3. And the consequence is that we're really going to be focusing on three of these enthalpies and adding these three values together. So the delta H for the overall is going to be essentially this value. And just to keep my negatives and adding and subtracting, I'll try to keep things in brackets. And so the result is that that value is going to be negative 1,076.5 kilojoules. You'll notice that uh, we always communicate this to one decimal place when we're doing these types of calculations. So that's just one thing that we can keep in mind. Next up, we might be given a situation where we are asked for the enthalpy change of a reaction but actually given no reference information. But truthfully, there will be stuff that we can reference just out of our data booklet. So if we go to a table that's marked standard molar enthalpies of formation, what we're going to do, again, is to focus on the compounds. And the compounds that are in here that we're worried about, since oxygen O2 is considered to be an element, uh, we're going to be looking at these compounds. So butane, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. Now from this, we can generate a number of equations. And 
that would look like this. However, this is a little bit overboard. We actually don't have to go quite to this extent. However, this is going to allow us to look at the uh, solution to the problem through a slightly different way. Now, this by all means is absolutely legitimate because that table uh, that I refer to refers to enthalpies of formation. Formation reactions then involve the conversion of elements into the compound that we have in question. So when we write down the enthalpy of formation for butane, for example, we're assuming that carbon and hydrogen are getting together to make butane. And then we can assign a delta H value to that particular reaction. We can do the same thing for uh, carbon dioxide and for water vapor, and then apply Hess's law as discussed before by focusing on the positions of the compounds and then focusing on the coefficients of the compounds in order to generate an answer. I am, however, going to look at this through a slightly different way and show you an algebraic way of handling the same problem. So when we look at applying uh, the system that uh, will allow us to take those uh, molar enthalpies of formation and just deal with them algebraically, we use a relationship like this one, where the delta H on the left is actually the net uh, energy change or enthalpy change for the overall reaction. The sigma means that we're going to take the sum of a product that we're going to see in a moment. We're going to multiply together the N for a particular product, like a chemical product. And so we look at the first chemical product that's there and reference the molar enthalpy of formation. So that's the delta FH naught symbol that's there. By multiplying the coefficient times that value, we get the first term of what we would uh, need to solve for the overall equation. We do that step by step for all of the products, and then you separate that from all of the reactants with the negative sign separating those processes. So the whole previous example would look like this, where we did the uh, combustion of butane so what we would do is look one at a time and say, well, there seems to be the four moles of carbon dioxide. And on the previous slide, that had a referenced molar enthalpy of formation of negative 393.5. So the application then is that we take the N, the four moles of CO2 as the coefficient, and multiply it by the referenced uh, molar enthalpy of formation, which was 393.5. The sum of tells us that I'm going to add that to the other product, which is the water vapor. So in this case, I'm going to take the 5 as the coefficient in front of water vapor, multiply it, that into the delta FH value of negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole of water, and that will complete all of the work I have to do for the products. At this point, it might be a good idea to put a large bracket around that, just to separate out all the work that you've done for the products away from the work that you're now going to do for the reactants. Although in the case of the reactants, it might be a little bit redundant, so we won't be necessarily showing that. So then the one reactant molecule or compound that we have is uh, butane. So we have the one coefficient in front times the molar enthalpy of formation that we reference, and that's what that looks like. Notice that we're not paying attention to the oxygen. As a reference point, we say that elements like O2 do not have an enthalpy of formation. In other words, their enthalpy of formation is zero, and therefore they don't have to be included in this type of a, a calculation. So at the end, if we do products minus reactants, that would be a turn of phrase we could use to describe this, we could quickly find out that the amount of energy involved in this reaction is that it releases 2,657 0.3 kilojoules of energy. So one thing that we can use uh, this application of Hess's law for is to make quick comparisons between reactions. And common reactions that we have to study in this course include photosynthesis, cellular respiration, and of course combustion like in this question. So if we have a look at comparing 
the combustion of glucose in an open system to the metabolism of glucose in a living system, we notice some interesting changes. Again, if we apply this relationship to the equation, this would be the combustion of glucose in an open system. So we're taking the glucose, reacting it with oxygen, produces water vapor, particularly. And if we then grab all of the information from our data booklet, we would get this relationship here. Seems pretty straightforward. Again, we can put the square brackets just to define our products and our reactants. And the consequence of having this information here, if we went through with the calculation, is we would find that the combustion of glucose in an open system releases 2,538.5 kilojoules overall. Seems like a pretty big value. But now, if we were to do a comparison, we could actually do it very simply. If the goal was to just do the comparison energetically between the two processes, really all that we would have to do is compare the algebra as opposed to necessarily calculating the values. So if we do the same process, but now we have liquid water that's produced because we're going through cellular respiration, then you'll notice that the value for the molar enthalpy of formation for water has changed. This value here has actually become more negative than the previous one. And in terms of how we set up our equation, you'll notice that the consequence of that is that once we do our products minus reactants calculation, that first bracket is going to have a more negative value than you had before because the magnitude of that number is bigger than the 241.8 that there was on the previous slide. The consequence of that is that this reaction should actually involve more energy than the previous one. And we could figure that out just logically by comparing the differences between these two setups. Everything was the same about the carbon dioxide and the glucose. The only thing that changed was the magnitude of the molar enthalpy of formation due to the phase of water that we had in each system. Again, to confirm that, you could go through and do the calculation, and you'll find if you do it here, that it releases 2,802.5 kilojoules, which is in fact more energy released than the previous example. So that has been uh, different ways of predicting enthalpies, one using Hess's law and one using uh, basically products minus reactants or an algebraic way of doing that. And you should also be able to uh, handle these types of systems kind of forward and reverse. So previously we were looking at solving uh, delta H1 given, for example, delta H2 and delta H3. You should be able to work that backwards. Given any two of the uh, components, you should be able to find one unknown. Similarly here, if you were given the value of delta H but had an unknown molar enthalpy of formation, you should algebraically be able to rearrange that and solve for an unknown.